The Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Good morning. So it's almost 11, so I would like to start my presentation. Um, before I start, uh, I would like to read some sort of poem, which might not be of a huge uh, poetic uh, value, but might give you a hint what you can expect from this presentation. Today, my friends, I wanted to speak in common tongues, yet, however deep I saw them, they were extinct for long. Arise, O oh fallen languages, let pride awake your course, empower us with knowledge that many a tribe had summoned. No single sound is worthless, no elder's tale is dumb, yet only names are left while the worlds lie in oblivion. Today, fellow polyglots and language lovers, I would like to talk about two things that might seem completely different and unrelated, but one of the goals of this presentation is to make you believe that, is to convince you that the two are actually very interrelated and have a big, big connection between each other. So the contents of my presentation is going to be as follows. First, I'm going to introduce to the climate change and language loss phenomena and their interrelation. Uh, then to denote the linguistic diversity using some attempts to uh, quantify the linguistic diversity in the world. And also climate change as the corporate accelerator of the language loss, evaluation of its effect on languages, but using my small study. And then, of course, questions and answer time. And I hope to have you, you to, I expect your cooperation during the question and answer time. So uh, if you have some questions, I would be happy because it would mean that I presented it clearly enough. Uh, what are the goals? Uh, so as I noted, uh, I would like to introduce you to an underreported yet existing relation between climate change and language loss. Um, to make us aware of the richness of the world that we live in, the richness of multiculturalism, and the extent of its fragility. And to make some suggestions to improve the status quo, uh, if there are any, which uh, I do believe there are. So, uh, what is the climate change? Uh, I don't know if everyone here in, the, uh, in this room are aware of uh, this phenomena. Maybe you've heard something, but what I would like to point out is that uh, the climate change is not only about the global warming. Yes, global warming plays a very important part in the climate change, but you have some, uh, 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 some related phenomena coming from the uh, global warming. And uh, the climate change is not uh, about uh, the weather trends for one year, but it's the weather trends for decades. So you still might get some very cold years, but the tendency as a whole is uh, that it's warming every year. And Sadly, but on the other side, maybe hopefully, we are one of the main culprits because the climate change is happening mostly due to uh, the human activities. And the, the two are uh, the uh, some uh, definitions by the most authoritative organizations, and they both use those three terms to denote there's three aspects to denote climate change. So uh, what we see is that uh, the temperature has increased for almost one degree, cent one, uh, degree by Celsius, uh, starting from the Industrial Revolution. We have some fluctuations, but we have a very clear tendency of the temperature rise. 
And then what can we expect in the future? Well, depending on how uh, we cope with this issue, we might expect the world to heave by uh, up to five degrees, or it's in, th in theory it's possible to uh, make uh, this warming very minimal. And uh, what's really bad about the climate change is that the sea level rise threatens uh, small tribes' existence. I'm talking especially about the tribes in the islands, in some most vulnerable places in the world, where the governments do not find uh, enough money to cope with these problems, or which are situated in the places where it would be very hard to uh, mitigate the effects. Yes. And uh, since 70% of the coastlines worldwide are projected to experience a sea level change within 20% of the global mean. Uh, and uh, here we see that the sea level rise might rise to up to one meter at the worst scenario. And uh, even half a meter, it's, it would be a big problem for uh, small island states. And now moving more to the linguistic part, before I merge the two, uh, I think uh, most of us have heard of the language extinction, and I think it's not difficult to, to know la what language extinction is all about. But the problematic thing is to uh, quantify when the language dies. If usually languages that die are uh, not uh, researched properly, they, they lack research, so we don't know when it gets extinct. Uh, but another very important thing to note about the language loss is that uh, it goes. It might start from the language shift, uh, a phenomenon described by Doria in the 1980s, which means gradual displacement of one language by another in the lives of the community members, which means that a language which appears to be uh, uh, like uh, less dominant, which uh, become vulnerable or of the hegemony of the uh, more dominant language. Why languages die? Well, we can think of many aspects, and in some cases there are pro uh, aspects that play the primary uh, role, but in other cases there might be many aspects. So, uh, when talking about political nature, maybe. When we think of the political nature of uh, language extinction, we might think of those colonial times when colonies would uh, put some discriminatory laws under their colonies and t to some uh, linguistic linguistical laws. But the problem is that it's continuing to be like that even nowadays because not all countries, even developed ones. Uh, respect uh, linguistic diversity and uh, in some cases you need to make some very active measures to uh, preserve, to secure uh, um, language existence because some languages are very vulnerable and they need to have some push. Also economic nature is very important. Imagine people fleeing after the famine strikes their land so when people migrate, they tend to assimilate, if not the very generation that f flees, but then their children or the upcoming generations are not likely to be speaking their uh, former mother tongue. It's, and this is a very big problem for the smallest languages. Also cultural nature, there are uh, some terms like cultural cringe, when a nation or a tribe uh, feels <laughs> Uh, feel ashamed to, to speak their tongue. It means uh, sort of internalized uh, uh, inferiority complex. As I mentioned, migration might be, arise as the result of all those three reasons or any of these three, and it's very uh, detrimental for uh, small languages 
uh, because they, they lack a uh, number of speakers and it might be very faithful in a bad sense. Uh, now uh, let me use some physical terms. Synergy to denote how those three the, mm, factors merge together and might uh, boast language extinction. Uh, so synergy uh, comes from ancient Greek, it means a result that is greater than the simple sum of its parts. So for instance, if you have a language which, al which already shifts to another language or, or which uh, has the number of speaker speakers dec uh, decreasing every year, and then it's the least thing... Uh, yes. Uh, the least thing that the tribe uh, has uh, the least thing that the tribe wants to have is climate change because, uh, well, uh, for instance, if, if the tribe has to migrate, then they are more, uh, the existence of the language is more vulnerable uh, to extinction. For instance, the language shift is taking place in Australia, or Koa Logo Yo, language shifting to broken, and uh, and sadly, this language might be a uh, victim of the climate change as well, and it might boost its shift. Also, language convergence might take place, which means that two seemingly similar languages become even more similar, and this effect might, uh, might also be uh, sort of uh, boosted <coughs> by uh, the climate change, such as sea level rise or other issues. Uh, talking about the language in danger, there are different numbers. Uh, well, uh, it, it's considered... It, it is estimated uh, that there are uh, uh, roughly 7,000 living languages in the world, uh, but the number of the languages that might be considered vulnerable differs depending on the sources. Nevertheless, UNESCO and Ethnologue both give uh, very similar values. Uh, some 2,500 languages, but some most pessimistic uh, linguists estimate that 90% of all the languages might get ex extinct by the end of the century. Uh, talking about the language death, uh, how many languages do you think die every single year? Any ideas? No? Well, maybe, no, not, not that many. <laughs> no. A bit less. Uh, more, oh, but very close. The answer is, according to Ethnologue, six languages that we will have never spoken in. Six languages might not seem like a big number, but uh, imagine what happened if all six uh, official languages of the United Nations would cease to exist in one year. We will not have English, Spanish, Chinese, French, uh, Russian, Arabic in one year. We tend to minim we underestimate the importance of those tiny languages uh, because we don't know uh, or we know very li we have very limited information about it. Just think about it. Uh, languages distribution is also not in even in the world. Uh, talking about the number of speakers, Asia has well the highest number of people. <laughs> then the number of speakers is also the highest. But then you, need, you have this very tiny region of Pacific or Oceania with only 0.1% of the population. But then what happens with the language diversity? Pacific region has strikingly high number, over 1,300 languages. Such a tiny population of Oceania speaks so many languages. And then Europe, one of the least uh, linguistically diverse, actually the least uh, linguistically diverse uh, continent. Of course, Asia is the leader, but you, you might you get this disproportion, especially in terms of Oceania. How to denote linguistic diversity? 
it's not very easy to do that uh, if you want to be very objective from a scientific point of view. So Greenberg uh, suggested his own linguistic diversity index where he tried to put uh, uh, some probability theory into measuring it. So how it works? Uh, his, green, his linguistic diversity index assumes that uh, the probability of two random speakers from the same country having totally different mother, mother tongues. So as a, as a consequence, we have Papua New Guinea uh, with a strikingly high probability index and followed by Vanuatu and Solomon Islands, both in the region of Oceania or Pacific Islands. And then followed by, okay, oh, sorry. Uh, then followed by uh, African countries, Tanzania, Central African Republic and others. And when we talk about Europe, we might, we, we, we sometimes boast about our linguistic uh, diversity, but so Belgium would be the first one uh, among European countries and it's far below the most uh, diverse uh, Pacific Asian or Oceanic countries. And the least, uh, link just for your own interest, the least uh, linguistically diverse countries according to Greenberg would be North Korea and Haiti, because they're monolingual. <laughs> Is language extinction a huge loss? Someone might argue that, <coughs> what's the point? Why should we make such a fuss out of the language extinction? Because language extinction is a natural part of language existence. But my primary uh, counter-argument would be that there, there is no worthless cultures, no worthless peoples. So each uh, extinction, each death of the language is a big tragedy to our uh, global civilization. Uh, furthermore, language extinction is absolutely unnecessary and is in theory avoidable. And there are three primary arguments against uh, language extinction uh, proposed by Michael E. Krauss. Uh, one is the ethical argument, uh, just as I noted, uh, since uh, we should treat all cultures and languages as uh, worth being saved and flourish, uh, we should do our best to prevent their extinction. Also, we have much more anthropocentric, which means human-centered uh, aspect of saving languages, which is a scientific argument that a each language is unique and uh, it's beneficial to have more languages to uh, have better linguistic science or uh, to be able to research better about their relations with the languages. And another, another argument, biological one, or logosphere, which I'm going to talk more about. Uh, so it means that we imagine language as each language as unique and of an inestimable value, uh, and uh, e and the death of every language is a, is a threat to our global diversity. That's why we should uh, prevent it by all costs. Um, each language is a separate cosmos because uh, it saves a lot of knowledge uh, by a certain tribe and uh, this type of knowledge might be encountered only through a certain language and not in the others and one important note uh, is that there is a science called ethnobotany where some uh, scientists would uh, research uh, the, the number uh, which like the research, uh, the um, names of, of the plants and uh, the knowledge that the tribes acquired about medicinal plants and if those languages die before they are documented we might lose a lot of knowledge and it will 
it might have taken to lo lots of lots of time for us to regain this knowledge, or maybe it will be lost forever. And uh, yeah, there are some documented climate in induced language shifts and losses. For instance. Dasna language is reported to be on the verge of extinction after 2010 flooding. Or, uh, according to CNN journalist John D. Suter, Inupiat language is shifting in Shishmaref, Alaska, United States. Also, there is another language which is not considered uh, a vulnerable one, but is nevertheless is a good example of how the language might change and how it the change might be boosted by the climate change. Uh, so, uh, Shina language belongs to an Indo-Aryan language group in, smoke, in the spoken mostly in Jilted Baltistan. And uh, Zafar Shakir you know, from the Karakoram International University made his study and found that uh, the speakers of the language which were displaced as a result of some uh, natural calamities such as floods, uh, they t tend to mo make more code switchings, intra-sentential switchings, and intra-sentential switchings, blending and borrowing words, which might be one of the features of a language shift. And what's more, he found that uh, 30, he found 33% uh, of non-Shina language words when interviewed Shina people uh, living in displaced areas and hence being affected by, uh, let us, let's say, uh, more privileged languages. Uh, talking about my own study, uh, what I did, what I was trying to do is to denote the reason for uh, language extinction and or language loss or language shift so uh, I try to use a model map for uh, a model map for the sea level rise uh, when the sea level rises by one meter it's not really easy to see uh, because changes are very tiny but nevertheless they are very they're crucial for some nations and islands, especially in the Pacific region. And uh, another uh, reason that I try to take into account are uh, estimated droughts and floods. Because according to the International Plan Panel of the Climate Change, this assessment, climate change may increase the risk of river and coastal flooding, and there's this tendency that it is growing every year. So here you have precipitation projects according to quite optimistic uh, estimates of the future if we do not follow business as usual scenario but if we try to put Paris Agreement into practice. Uh, so we see that some areas might have much higher precipitation, and uh, but some will have will have uh, will be uh, affected by droughts, like the southern part of Africa or eastern part of Australia, among others. Uh, this is this estimate is for each twenty years. So at the end, we we have some. Mm, temperature decreased by approximately 20%, which is very uh, problematic for some regions, which already suffer from lack of water. Uh, so what were the results of my uh, study? Well, Pacific region is the most vulnerable uh, when it comes to the sea level rise, followed by Asia and Americas. And uh, consequently, Austronesian languages that are spoken in the Pacific region are also going to be uh, the ones that, are, that will be affected most, uh, followed by isolates and creoles. 
so we might expect uh, a lot of a lot of uh, different uh, languages. Uh, furthermore, uh, it really it, re it really is going to affect some uh, small islands, and small islands is going to be uh, entities being uh, influenced by the climate change negatively. Uh, for the most part, so we have 52 languages, 52 percent of languages affected by the sea level rise. 52 uh, percent of those languages are on small small islands. I'm talking about droughts. Africa is going to be the uh, big. Uh, well, we is going to suffer most from the droughts, and consequently. Afro-Asiatic languages are going to be subject to th this trend. And overall, Pacific region still is the most vulnerable one, uh, followed by Africa. And I tried to count uh, European languages that are going to be influenced by the climate change. It's uh, a bit uh, complicated because uh, those countries that uh, lie even below the sea level or near the sea level are likely to be able to be resilient to the effects of the climate change. So they might uh, uh, construct some polders so that they will not lose their territories. So their languages might not be affected. So you, hence you see Europe is uh, being less likely uh, affected by the climate change when it comes to their language preservance. And talking about the language families, uh, again, uh, Austronesian languages family, which is spoken in Oceania region, Oceanian region, are going to be a primary uh, hostages of the climate change, followed by Afro-Asiatic spoken in Africa, uh, followed by Pamanyungan spoken by uh, Aust Australian Aborigines, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, overall, the problem is that you have a lot of languages that are already facing a s severe uh, extinction, severe trend of extinction, they are still, uh, they are uh, very likely uh, to be affected by the climate change. So we have 32% of languages that are severely endangered and 21% are being definitely endangered, which means that they already have a very limited number of speakers. And nevertheless, they might have this synergetic effect of being affected by the climate change. And some examples, some concrete examples about the countries. Vanuatu, one of the most linguistic diverse countries in the world, having 138 languages, despite being such a tiny country by the number of inhabitants. It's the second most linguistically diverse country according to the uh, latter mentioned uh, diversity index. And uh, it has 46 languages as endangered as considered by UNESCO. Uh, also, it's noted for having the highest density of speakers. Each language has only uh, an estimated number of only 1,971 speakers. Sea level rise is a boring issue. The islands lie on the tectonic plate. Even though some of them are mountainous, their size might be a big problem for uh, upcoming typhoons. So this is this is a map of the uh, projected natural hazards by region. So you see that the primary reasons being cyclones, landslides, flooding, uh, or even drought, fire, <coughs> earthquakes, and Aramango, which is this tiny language here has already been most devastated linguistically, having lost some 80% of its indigen indigenous languages, according to the surveys by Crowley and Terry. 
And this is the list of the languages that are going to be affected by the climate change, which are, I mean, which uh, has a big probability of being affected by the climate change. Uh, the redder the color, uh, the more severely endangered they are. So I counted 10 languages. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, I use the source of the UNESCO Atlas of the, the Endangered Languages uh, because I wanted to put only those languages that are very likely to be affected by the climate change, but you might find even more that uh, have a uh, smaller probability to be affected by the climate change because they all lie in small, well, relatively small islands. Another unique country is Federated States of Micronesia, one of the smallest countries in the world which has a stunning number of languages, uh, with the territory being only 700 square kilometers. It has over 100,000 speakers and uh, 18 languages. Among them, 13 languages are considered to be endangered by UNESCO. And uh, I counted that almost all of them are going to be, are, are likely to be affected by the climate change. Here is the country. And these are the languages uh, that are going to be affected by the climate change. So, uh, uh, I would like to give some uh, uh, concrete examples of uh, uh, how some languages sound like, uh, so that we might know that uh, some very unique languages might disappear as a consequence of the climate change, among other issues. So for instance, there is a Dahala language, an endangered Cushitic language, spoken by some 4,000, four, sorry, 400, only 400 people. It uses all four stream mechanisms found in human languages, clicks, adjectives, and implosives, as well as the universal polemonic sounds. Uh, well, those uh, who are linguists by profession might be more aware about these four stream mechanisms but um, an important part is that there is no, at least no single documented language that use all four airstream mechanisms. This is how it sounds like, and we might lose this kind of pretty language, but we need to do uh, all we can to at least document languages like that. And another interesting <coughs> language is. I don't even know how to properly pronounce it. It's written as ta. Uh, most likely it is a language possessing the highest number of phonemes among the world languages, but it also falls on the um, so it's also in danger because of the climate change because uh, it might, the, the region might be struck by uh, the lack of uh, precipitations, like uh, the num like uh, they might be affected by droughts m m even more than they do now. So it's also spoken by a very limited of people and has at least 58 consonants, 31 vowels, and four tones, uh, depending on the uh, dialects. Uh, so maybe it's one of the most uh, complicated language to learn. And this is how it sounds. Uh, 
kikupa tetsi ke kenga uche bingu tsi ipal tona ngote bukai kun sa kete bukai la both of these files were provided by UCLA Phonetics Lab Archive, which can be found on YouTube. Uh, another sad thing is that two language family contains only two languages in the group, including this unique language that you have just heard. And another language also has a very limited number of speakers. So, what are my conclusions? I claim that climate change will likely affect people directly, in particular the ones who live in the least resilient places, uh, including countries that might not secure uh, the measures to prevent detrimental effects of the climate change. Uh, it will pose threat to smaller languages as a result. Uh, our diversity is very rich, but at the same time it's very brittle. A significant part of 70,000 languages are under the threat of extinction. And at least 130 languages, that's the number that I counted, uh, assuming that they are, they, the, the, those 130 languages are very likely to be affected by the climate change. Uh, so out of these languages, we have the most vulnerable continents in, like uh, Oceania and Africa. And one of my proposals about what we can do to secure uh, language diversity, linguistic diversity, is to be, uh, well, to say it in two words, go greener, but it means to be, uh, 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 to, to think about our actions and consequences and to, uh, to be more aware about our own lifestyle and to not to waste materials and resources or to learn or document the language which might be another issue uh, which would be another interesting activity but maybe not for everyone because it will take time and maybe your whole career but even uh, maybe more in it would be more influential and the final remarks of, are the following. The, the fact that the climate change might be an additional cause of language loss must not be ignored, even though it's still under-reported. Uh, that's why I, I decided to make this uh, new discourse. Well, quite new discourse. And the more species, the richer the Earth, the more tongues, the more diverse our civilization. So let us not be uh, indifferent about our own civilization and let us take measures to, pr to prevent their uh, disappearance. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> and I hope to hear several questions from you. Uh, could it? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the, the European languages uh, like were in the Middle Ages and how they were mingled into the French and uh, Latin like, le like uh, for example modern Spanish had also roots in Latin and Old Spanish and uh, yes. Old German and Old French and Old English how they were you know, mingled in the and the modern language. How this language had a heritage and roots in the modern languages of I spoke in, in Europe. Uh, you mean particularly in Europe or uh, other regions? No, because no, no. Uh, 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 mm, mm. I think uh, most of the European European languages were transformed over ages, and uh, being uh, subjected to different. Uh, uh, source source of languages, so they are uh, all of them are uh, like affected by each other. But I don't know uh, how uh, should I understand the, the point. Would you like me to give some examples of 
languages in Europe or in the in the future, in the upcoming future, or already in the past? No, in the, uh, in the past, like Latin, how, to, how has it is the heritage and influence in other uh, Romance languages, like Romanian, French, and uh, German, and English. Latin language that was official in the Middle Ages, early Yeah, but Europe. for instance, even English language was uh, mixed. We had some very strong influences of, uh, yeah, like, uh, well, some especially big influence of French and a lot of Latin loan words, as well as maybe, if, if I'm not mistaken, Breton influence. And there were more other languages like that, yeah. Could anyone pass the microphone, please? Um, this is besides languages, but as far as dialects go, for example, I know that in yeah. the United States, for example, with the younger generation, most people don't really speak with the Shon dialect anymore. Do you think that could also happen in Europe, for example, as far as the extinction of dialects? Yes, certainly. Um, and the problem is that uh, there is a... You know, the classification of whether la the language is a separate language or just a mere dialect can be a, a sort of a political issue and in some cases it's really hard to distinguish between languages and dialects because some dialects are uh, to some extent uh, are not intelligible to the speakers of a standard language uh, but uh, what I really support in terms of the classification by the UNESCO is that they include dialects as well in their maps because in some cases it's hard to know whether it's a dialect or not. I even in Europe, there are, especially in, among Romance languages, uh, a lot of Romance languages were considered dialects. Uh, like Galician used to be considered a dialect, but now it's uh, accepted as a separate language. Even in, in, in Slavic uh, language group, there is, for instance, Rusin, dialectal language which was considered an Ukrainian dialect or some magician dialect which might be considered a separate Baltic language even though it's considered a Lithuanian dialect or Latgalian whether it's a dialect or a separate Baltic language. Yeah. So I hope I answer your question. Uh, then uh, him and then okay. Uh, okay. after him. Um. I just started studying Lithuanian a few weeks ago, and uh, I've been reading about. Congratulations <laughs> <laughs> for having chosen such a uh, complicated language. Uh, true. Uh, so I have read that in the past Latvian and Lithuanian were one, and maybe in the 1300s it's separated. And Lithuanian has many dialects, and maybe these dialects are coming under danger with technological advances and so. Do you want to discuss something about the evolution of the Lithuanian language and any kinds of things you consider in danger? Yeah, I would say uh, I would say that uh, certainly. Thank you for the question. Lithuanian uh, dialects are um, endangered indeed, and uh, especially. The younger generation, uh, well, finds it more difficult to speak in dialects, and in some cases, you have this some, this sort of cultural cringe, as I noted, when you have this inferiority complex. You people would consider you as a sort of uneducated person if you speak a dialect, but maybe this trend is changing now and. People are, some people are, have uh, even pride in speaking the dialect rather than a standard language. But um, overall, I would not say that the revivalist, uh, tiny revivalist movements uh, outnumber uh, some murky tendencies. Uh, talking about Lithuan Lithuanian language as such, we have this issue of whether Samogitian dialect is a dialect or a language. Some Samogitian enthusiasts consider it a separate language because it is much mutually unintelligible to the speakers of Augustatian dialect. 
and uh, some friends of mine claim that they cannot understand some magician. <laughs> so it's it, it's also up to yeah it's um, well yeah it's it's a matter of decision. But as for now, it, for instance, even some magician has a an ISO code SGS, which means that it's it's classified as a separate language by uh, Ethnolog, if I'm not mistaken, because it has a code. Uh, but yes, uh, maybe in the past we had less contact contact with dialects, but now uh, all Lithuanians uh, try to speak uh, standard Lithuanian, so that's why the dialects are uh, the usage of dialects is decreasing um, as a tendency. Um, you spent the whole lecture uh, talking about uh, the issues and the consequences and you only spent 30 seconds on the solutions. Uh, so do you really believe that uh, those languages are likely to be saved? Or yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. Thank you for your note. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but I mean... Yeah, well, uh, it would, otherwise my presentation would have taken even more time. Uh, sort of apologies, but I uh, think uh, we, maybe each of us have different strategies on how to cope with them. And, uh, those who have, those who are, those who feel, uh, well, among those who, who feel that they are responsible for what is going on. So, uh, yeah. uh, so for me, uh, I think. The, uh, I, I think that it's, in some cases it's quite difficult to save all those languages, but the, the least but at what we can expect is that we document them properly, so we will not uh, lose uh, you know, the knowledge that was acquired by the speakers. It's very sad to state this, but some languages cannot be saved, but I don't want them to get extinct without any recognition, because I imagine the existence of a language as the, exist as the existence of a star. When a star dies, it gives away its uh, rays and uh, molecules to uh, planets and stars near nearby. And, uh, it does not go to waste. So what I would like to do is that even if languages get extinct, they, they would be properly documented. And maybe some of them might be, be revived by some revivalists. Some Prussian, for instance, revivalists trying to revive Prussian, or just as Hebrew language speakers revived Hebrew language. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you said that about six languages die every year, um, and I was wondering if in the past, especially just thinking, I could be totally wrong about this, but I have the idea that there were a huge number of tribal languages, especially in the Americas, that are now extinct. So say when we uh, invaded America, did we kind of kill languages off at a much higher rate in the past? And now it's slowed down because there isn't as much um, expansionism and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. colonization going on. That's an interesting note. It would be quite difficult to estimate uh, the number of languages getting extinct at that time and ex getting extinct now. On the one hand, yes, uh, I think we Europeans uh, had made a lot of languages getting extinct when we colonized. Uh, Americas, for instance. Uh, but on the other hand, now, due to the globalization, not all the languages survive. But like, uh, there is a mingle of languages, and, ti and more tiny languages are less likely to survive globalization. Because on the one hand, globalization can save languages if they are properly documented, and if uh, the speakers do not uh, experience cultural cringe. But on the other hand, when you get this technology dominated by a few languages, maybe not six, but let's say 100, 
and then the rest, 6,900 languages are, are getting some kind of obsolete in the technological sphere. It also affects their viability, and that's why I would doubt that uh, the speed of the language extension is lower now. That's my point. question about the Latvian. Um, yes. I come original from Latvia, that way. Yeah. Uh, what is the point when we can say that the dialect has become a separate language? I think one of the points is that, as I said, uh, it's, uh, it's just a matter of our mutual mutual agreement whether to consider a dialect a separate language or not. Uh, because we there are a lot of European languages that are for instance, less different than Latgalian from Latvian, and which are considered uh, separate languages, not dialects. Uh, so one, one of the points why it is better to consider it, uh, such the different dialects as languages is that it ha they would have different status and could be protected. Uh, for instance, I, re I heard that Latgalian language is now considered like a, a form of Latvian mm, which is nevertheless considered a, a language so it's, it's very complicated but it means that you have a better status for Latgalian speakers while in Lithuania very very few uh, linguists would claim that some addition is, is a language and so if you have a dialect you know, people say, ah, it's just a dialect, well, who cares if it gets extinct or not? Yeah, but if it's a language, it's, you have those tools to prevent the language from extinction. So that's my point. Thank you.